Sitting alone at the end of the bar, Samuel takes another sip from what's now his ninth beer. He can't believe what a day he's had. He feels like God has cursed him. He looks up at the clock. It reads 2214. Twelve hours ago, things were still normal. In the morning, he found out he lost his job over something silly he'd written on Twitter years ago. When he explained to his girlfriend he was now out of work, she told him in no uncertain terms, it's over, you're a loser. He then went home to his high-rise apartment only to be informed by his neighbor that his beloved cat had jumped off the balcony and not exactly fallen on its feet as they're supposed to. The neighbor had at least picked up the pieces. As if the day couldn't have gotten any worse, his mom called him in the afternoon in tears telling him she was having an affair, and anyway, he wasn't actually her biological child he'd been lied to all his life. This can't be real, he mutters to himself, getting a funny look from the bartender. How did I get to this point in life? God. Please tell me this is a joke, he says. Where are you when I need you? Here I am, Sam, he hears in a booming voice. It's me, God. Sam looks around the bar. The bartender is still cleaning glasses. The woman at the other end of the bar is still scrolling on her smartphone. White Snake's Here I Go Again is still playing on the jukebox. Sam almost jumps out of his socks as God suddenly appears at his side, sipping on a Bloody Mary cocktail. A little heavy on the Tabasco and light on the vodka, me thinks, God tells Sam, smiling. From his glass, he removes the large chili pepper impaled on a cocktail stick, shaking his head in disdain. I never did like that. No need for it, God says. But you can't beat a good hangover drink. Sam is speechless. He looks around to see if anyone else can see what he's seeing. They can't. Sam pinches his arm and rubs his eyes as God looks at him contemplatively. You asked for me, mate, and I'm here. God is Australian? Thinks Sam in disbelief. God starts playing the drums on the table with his index fingers. I like this bit, he says to the lyrics. Never seem to find what I'm looking for. Oh Lord, I pray you give me strength to carry on. God explains to Sam that he knows what a horrible day he's had and that he doesn't like to see his children in such a mess. And that's why he likes to make the occasional appearance and anyway, he likes the cocktails down on earth. Much better than in heaven where they're criminally lacking in alcohol content. God seems to draw a square with his fingers right in front of both of them. Out of nowhere comes what looks like a big TV screen. He tells Sam he's going to watch something. Sam looks at the images on the screen. God says to him, You asked how you got to this point. I'll show you. Sam watches the screen as God explains. Okay, well, basically there was this little dot. And that dot went bang and the bang expanded. Energy formed into matter. Matter cooled. Matter lived. The amoeba to fish. Fish to fowl. Fowl to frog. Frog to mammal. Mammal to monkey. Monkey to man. Amo amasamat. Quid pro quo, memento mori ad infinitum, sprinkle on a little bit of grated cheese and leave under grim till doomsday. God tells Sam, it was nice having a drink with him, but time is of the essence and he has places to be. No rest for the wicked, God says, ironically. It's not the first time he's told this joke, not by a long shot. That doesn't make me feel any better, says Sam. God can see that, and he accepts that it was a lazy attempt to outline literally everything. It wasn't even his story, he'd actually stolen it from a movie he likes. Also, he knows when he's told the full story, he's never failed to cheer people up and make them appreciate life, especially when he explains the meaning of life at the end. Okay, okay, God says, and takes a big slurp of his Bloody Mary. I'll give you the longer version. But he explains there's a caveat, in that this explanation is on a need-to-know basis. Sam will hear what's already out there in the world. It wouldn't be fair of God to say any more. God begins his detailed story. In the beginning, there was nothing. But it's very reasonable to ask, how do you create something out of nothing? Can there really be nothing since there always must be something? Not really, according to some scientists, said God. One scientific hypothesis says the universe is cyclical, meaning that there has been an almost total absence of matter that eventually turned into our universe. But one day, many years from now, all this matter will be totally consumed by devouring black holes. They themselves will then boil into photons and be lost in a kind of void until again, there's almost a total absence of matter. Then it will take another big bang to get things going again. It's a pretty time-consuming cycle in more ways than one. It's infinite. That's only one theory out there of many, God tells Sam. He explains that there's also the theory that he put the universe together in just six days, but that's a belief that has lost a bit of traction as of late. Still, plenty of scientists and other heady thinkers embrace the idea of a grand designer that was there when the big bang happened. Religion and science aren't always at odds with each other. When the Big Bang happened some 13.82 billion years ago, there could have been a universe of sorts, but nothing in it. There was just a very small ball with an infinite density that was intensely hot. The word small doesn't really do it justice. The dot was a million billion billionth the size of a single atom. This is called the singularity. It exploded with magnificent force. 
only it didn't send things flying all over the place as there was no place for things to fly. Instead, the force expanded the dot. What was a little dot started stretching and has stretched so much that we can see light that's 13.8 billion years away. In fact, there is matter in people's bodies that is billions of years old. That should make people feel pretty special. Do you feel special right now? God asks Sam. Sam shakes his head, thinking about what he's lost today. God carries on. Right after the Big Bang, one trillionth of a second after it, things really got going. The theory, which is only a theory, is that the forces of gravity, electromagnetism, as well as strong and weak nuclear forces appeared within these very small fractions of a second. All of this energy became what's called matter and antimatter. And as you can guess, they canceled each other out. But the good news is, some matter survived. Protons and neutrons formed within this first second. The universe started to expand. Things were extremely hot. What was being made was space. This is known as cosmic inflation. The universe is still expanding now, but not at the rate it did during the cosmic inflation period. It took about 300,000 years for the nuclei to capture electrons to make atoms. This led to hydrogen and helium gas clouds filling the universe. There were no planets or stars yet, just this deep fog. Then we have a very long period called the Dark Ages. This is from around 380,000 years to a billion years. At around 10 million years, things really started to cool down, and they cooled for many millions of years. This is when water might have appeared and when there was the first primordial light. At around 100 million years, there was some gravitational collapse leading to particles becoming structures, the early stars. These might not have lasted too long, unlike the stars today, so they might have burst into what's called supernova after only 1 million years. But the stars grouped together in what we call galaxies. All of this happened in the Dark Ages from 200 to 500 million years. God stops for a second and then looks at Sam, who now appears to be confused. He's got the look of a man who's just finished watching a David Lynch movie. God reassures Sam that he doesn't need to know the exact science, and anyway, much of how the universe was formed is still up for debate. God keeps going. Despite the obvious frustration of the human in front of him, it never fails to amaze him that humans always want to get to the meaning of life before hearing what life is. All they ever think about is themselves, God muses, but not with any ill will. God doesn't do negativity. So these stars and galaxies formed, and they became pretty much what we see today. One of them is our galaxy, the Milky Way. This is also still expanding, possibly at a rate of about 600 kilometers per second. It's just one of about 100 billion galaxies. Within the Milky Way, there might be anywhere from 100 to 400 billion stars. As for how many stars there are in all of the universe, that's not easy to say. But the word on Science Street is around 200 billion trillion. There are bits of the Milky Way that date back to the very beginning of the universe, with some recent estimates saying it began forming about 800 million years after the Big Bang. That was parts of it, not the entire shaboodle we see today. According to NASA, astronomers have discovered more than 3,200 solar systems in the Milky Way. But with so many stars hanging about, there might be as many as 100 billion other solar systems we just can't see the planets. In the middle of our solar system is a massive, almost perfectly shaped ball of hot plasma, the star we all can't live without, aka the Sun. Like all stars, one day it will burn itself out, but that's not something humans need to worry about anytime soon. This object, about 330,000 times bigger than the Earth, is the reason we are alive. It will likely engulf the Earth in around 5 billion years, so we don't need to panic just yet. Now for the exciting part, says God, just as Sam looks like he's starting to lose interest. It's true that all of us down here are literally made of stars. The very stuff that made it possible for our bodies to be made is the matter that came from those supernovas. The elements were made inside stars, a process called nucleosynthesis. When they exploded and became supernovae, they seeded the next stars. A kind of cosmic chemical evolution took place when these new stars, let's call them the next generation of stars, produced different, heavier elements than the previous stars hadn't made. In time, most of the elements we find in our periodic table were produced in our own solar system, and we are a product of this system. So we're bits of the ancient universe. It's possible that some of the hydrogen in humans, which is about 9.5% of us, was made in the Big Bang. Doesn't that make you feel special? Asks God. Only to find Sam is watching a video on his phone consisting of a good-looking young man handing a $20 bill to a homeless person in California. It's a fake, says God. I do pity you humans sometimes. Sam puts his phone down. That's all well and good, says Sam, but how did we get here? Jesus, said God. Chill, I was just about to explain that. As you know, bits of exploding stars, which are called solar nebulae, hang out in space. These formed the Earth about 4.54 billion years ago. There were volcanoes on the early Earth, and they spit out a lot of gas. 
This process is called outgassing, and it was the process that gave our atmosphere and our oceans. The beginning was a very unstable time for Earth. Objects kept whacking us, including when something big hit us and formed the moon. Much of what was down here after that was molten rock, not exactly a good place for life to flourish, but things cooled down. About 4 billion years ago, a period called the Archean period began. That's when all that molten stuff hardened and turned into what we call land. But it was in the water where all the cool stuff happened. Again, this is only a hypothesis, but life started around 4 billion years ago, as the scientist Richard Dawkins said, along with many other eggheads, somewhere in the water, what is often called the primordial swamp. A chemical reaction took place, perhaps with the aid of sunlight, and a very special molecule was made. A molecule is a bunch of atoms that have banded together to make a chemical compound. Everything is made of molecules, including you, the screen you're looking at, and the air you're breathing. Sound, though, and the feelings you now have while watching this, plus the light, are not made of molecules. What happened next in the primordial swamp billions of years ago was special. A molecule was created that could replicate itself. It fought to survive by passing on bits of itself. Scientists are not too sure, though, exactly how they replicated, but we do know that they did. They became what has been called a self-sustaining chemical system. These molecules combined and formed more complex molecules, and some of those molecules were the so-called building blocks of life, amino acids. It's amino acids that make proteins. We won't get into the nitty-gritty here, and scientists don't always agree anyway, but something must have existed to make it possible for molecules to replicate and pass versions of themselves on. Scientists say DNA and RNA, as well as some other basic building blocks, made life possible. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is made from molecules called nucleotides. You don't need to know what nucleotides are because things would just get too complicated. All of these molecules that wanted to survive and replicate became a cell, a single cell at first. This first cell might have popped up around 3.5 billion years ago. You might consist of about 37 trillion cells, so let's just say you are complicated. The theory is that single cells came together to form multicellular organisms since their chances of survival were better that way. Then cell groups just kept getting more complicated. Over time, and we mean over a lot of time, these simple organisms adapted to become better at surviving. Dawkins calls organisms survival machines since he thinks all organisms are there for is to ensure the survival of their genes. Oh damn genes, I kinda skipped over that, said God, again noticing that Sam looks a little confused. Don't worry Sam, he says, it'll get easier. God again takes a deep breath and continues. Organisms got more complicated. Sponges appeared in the sea. About 500 million years ago, we got fish. And 475 million years ago, we got land plants. Mmm, tasty. At some point, what was in the sea realized they might have a better chance of survival on land, so they wriggled out. We got amphibians about 360 million years ago, and reptiles about 60 million years later. Genetic mutations made this possible. Later, we got mammals and birds, and about 65 million years ago, the dinosaurs had a bad time when the Earth was rocked by a giant asteroid. Stuff survived, it replicated, it adapted, and evolved, and about 2.4 million years ago, proto-humans, we call Homo habilis, aka Handyman, started making tools to stick in the eye of the wild beasts they wanted to kill and eat. This making of tools was a pretty nifty trick. It gave those first proto-humans a massive advantage. Then we stood upright most of the time and became Homo erectus. Over a period of hundreds of thousands of years, this smart animal started moving around more and getting out of Africa and setting up shop in Asia. These early humans kept evolving and they got even smarter, and much later even started doing stuff like drawing pictures on cave walls. This really separated them from the other animals. I don't feel smart, quips Sam. Oh, but Sammy, my boy, God says, you're a genius compared to a spider, and stop interrupting me. How did we go from a minute bunch of cells moving mindlessly around in the ocean to becoming an animal that can kill a fish with a sharpened spear? The answer is that in every organism's DNA, which you'll remember is found in the cells, are genes. DNA is passed down from organism to organism, which is why we call it hereditary. We have it in all of our cells. You started as one single cell. But all things require a kind of building instruction manual, which is why you have genes. Genes are part of your DNA. Many of them contain the code to make proteins that make up the organism. Humans share almost 99% of their DNA with chimps, but we're nothing alike, really, in that chimps haven't even figured out how to start a fire, never mind write Shakespearean verse or build rockets that can travel to space. We came from the same ancestor, but we have evolved very differently because of our genes. Genes are contained in chromosomes, of which there are 46 inside every cell. One set of 23 from our mother and one set of 23 from our father. 
Each chromosome contains thousands of instructional genes. Remember, we have a ridiculous number of cells, so all over you, you have genes that have been selected to make you, well, you. That solitary sperm cell and that egg that you started out from carry your father and your mother's genome, which is the complete set of genetic instructions required to make you. We have genes to make eyes and eyes look pretty much the same and that they're not square and have similar functions, but we get different colored eyes and we get eyes with better or worse eyesight. God looks at Sam who is fading again. He says, do you realize Sam that you are completely unique? There has never been anyone quite like you and there never will be someone quite like you. You are one of a kind. Sam just shrugs. Human life shouldn't have even been possible, but it happened. We happened. God then explains that in order for everything we see around us to happen, we had to get along together in various ecosystems. Our bodies evolved, but we also evolved in a system. The living world only exists because life forms have figured this out and they've done it unconsciously through their genes. Humans now can talk about this and be conscious of it. But a bee does not feel grateful when it pollinates a flower and a flower doesn't usually write on social media, just been pollinated. We do what we've been programmed to do. Within all this survival of the fittest business, we create what's called evolutionary stable strategies. Lions don't usually kill and eat other lions. Humans don't generally eat their kids and birds don't all share the nests. Because animals have figured out that it's the best strategy for survival. We might be selfish sometimes, but we can be kind too, it's all part of the strategy. So when your girlfriend dumps you, you lose a job or you get typhus, it's just part of nature. If pain and sickness and loss had not existed, we would never have improved and become what we are today. If we didn't ever feel rejection or loss, we wouldn't survive as humans. It's how we deal with loss and failure that makes us stronger, that can make us wiser. The hardest times you will face as an animal will likely make you a better, more intelligent animal if you can indeed get past them. Winning doesn't always signify strength. Sometimes winning is easy when we have all the best resources, the best training, and the most supportive people around us. It's how we deal with loss and adversity and how we learn to adapt and overcome these things that shows the true strength of a human. So Sam, says God. That's a roundabout way to say that what happened to you today provides you with an opportunity to become a better person. Actually, I didn't even like that job, Sam replies. And do you really think your ex is a great loss if she dumped you over losing that job? Asks God. Sam slowly shakes his head. Not all humans evolved to be good at basketball, mathematics, or for having their beautiful faces printed on the front pages of glossy magazines. But each person is special and all have some traits that can help them to excel. Sure, things can be learned throughout the journey we call life, but some people might have more of a capacity to be open-minded, imaginative, hardworking, precise, resilient, conscientious, athletic, kind, or humble. Everyone can excel at something if they can figure out what they're good at. So Sam asks God, so what's the meaning of life? To excel? You sound like one of those motivational videos on YouTube. God laughs and explains from a strictly evolutionary point of view, humans are here to procreate or at least pass on their genes. There's the selfish gene theory that the genes themselves unconsciously, since they don't have minds, want to replicate, just like those primordial floating bits of matter did. This theory might not even mean you have to have kids since your genes are contained to a lesser extent in your brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. Even your tribe might have more in common with you than people who live far away. But this meaning of life is biological rather than mental or spiritual. There's more to life than banging and making babies, says God. He goes on. The Buddhists believe that life is suffering, but there are things we can do to lessen the suffering. Pain and death are still inevitable, and they have to be. God tells Sam that he had no fun watching the 20th century as Hitler, Stalin, and Mao caused widespread misery and needless death, but there's no good in being angry all the time. Something can be learned from the uniquely human evil. He tells Sam about a little book he likes called The Gulag Archipelago in which the Russian writer lists endless atrocities handed down to his people who had already suffered starvation and war. Joseph Stalin then had many of them tortured and thrown into labor camps. How could anyone think life is fair after that? God explains that there's a character in the book that accepts his fate only because he doesn't want what's happening to him to make him a worse person. For him, having grace, remaining kind and loving under such hardship is a kind of test. It's taught him how to evolve personally as a human. The writer of the book, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, said, Bless you, prison, bless you for being in my life. For there, lying upon the rotting prison straw, I came to realize that the object of life is not prosperity as we are made to believe, but the maturity of the human soul. As a famous philosopher once said, 
If you make it your duty to fight monsters, make sure that that doesn't turn you into a monster. God suddenly starts to look contemplative and says to Sam, I remember my son once telling me to forgive the Romans that had mocked him while he was on the cross. He was a good kid, that lad. I must get in touch with him again. No sooner than the thought comes to him, he moves on. Suffering might help us evolve if we put some effort in and don't go to the dark side ourselves, but that doesn't mean we should make ourselves suffer. Quite the opposite, we should be above that. We should have compassion for our fellow animals. We might be selfish at a genetic level, but being good to others should be a principle of ours. After all, selfish people are rarely happy or content. So even being good can be kind of a selfishness because you know there's a payoff in the end. Okay, Sam says, I get it, I'm made of stars, I'm totally unique, I'm good at something and can flourish. I should learn from my negative experiences. But what's the point other than that? Why do I or we exist at all? What are we making down here in this chemical factory for the future? God doesn't answer, but he goes off on one of his tangents. He explains that everyone we know will eventually die, the planet itself will die, as will the universe. And if those cyclic scientists are right, it'll all start again, everything will reoccur indefinitely but not the same. Sam interrupts, I was just starting to feel better and now you're making me think everything's totally pointless. God tells him not to think about the greater scheme of things but to concentrate on what's happening in his own life. He says many thinkers have talked about the absurdity of the human condition, but some have embraced it and still tried to leave a virtuous life. God adds, sure, many people throughout history have said bombing people, crucifying people, or even dumping boyfriends or firing people was for the greater good and therefore virtuous. But it's only the most intelligent of humans that can understand that power corrupts and so are careful to wield it. God reminds Sam of what Spider-Man's Uncle Ben once said, with great power comes great responsibility. That saying is much older than comic books, says God, and it's something we all should remember because we all have the power to cause pain and anguish in this world. God then tells him about something the French philosopher Michel de Montaigne once wrote. When he wasn't talking about his philosophy of death, he asked a simple question. He said, when people are on their deathbed, why do they generally become very thoughtful and forgiving? They seem to become the best version of themselves only when it's too late. They accept their death and they seem to embrace the notion of love. Many seem to suddenly understand the faults they had, the bad things they did. They seem to appreciate the small things, the grass blowing in the wind, the smell of baking bread, a human hand on their shoulder. And that's why Montaigne said he contemplated his death every day and tried to live his life knowing it might be over anytime soon. He started to think this way after his own near-death experience. He also made sure to help others when he could so they might also appreciate their lives. He was humble too, once saying, on the loftiest throne in the world, we are still sitting only on our own rump. Sam asks, I still don't think you've told me the meaning of life in the universe. That's the point, says God. The meaning of life is for you to find some meaning, to be the best that you can be. It's not something a physicist, a cosmologist, or a philosopher can tell you. The universe might not have a purpose, but you do. He tells Sam that the nature of the universe might be comparable to Sisyphus pushing that ball of a rock up a hill for eternity. But he reminds Sam that everything he does, everything he says, has a meaning and is consequential. He can alleviate pain and sadness, he can make people happy or sad, he can listen to people, tell stories, go on adventures, and all these things will leave a mark on the world. God looks over to the bar, where that same woman is still scrolling on her device. He tells Sam that this is a woman with her own story, and like all humans, it will be a complex story. Sam and she might disagree on many things, they might not vote for the same political party, but if Sam was curious enough and authentic enough, he might just be able to get along with this stranger. He might learn something from her, as she might from him. The possibilities are almost infinite as to what a small engagement could lead to. There's a chance, a small chance maybe, God says, that they could enjoy each other's company if he only approaches her with an open mind. Life is consistently full of missed opportunities, says God. I've been witness to this for an eternity. Sam shoots back, but she won't want to talk to me, she might be close-minded. She'll probably tweet something like, total jerk just harassed me at the bar, and then slip in a puke emoji. God tells him one of his favorite expressions, it takes two to tango. He adds that we can gain so much through mutual recognition, if only we allow ourselves to be conscious of the other person's autonomy. Sam realizes that he might have done something similar to what he thinks the woman would do, but he wouldn't now, not after his chat with God. You come here often? asks Sam. God jokingly replies, that's what she said, but he soon adds no. Sam says, you should, it's been enlightening. God disappears the moment he says it, without giving Sam the opportunity to say thanks or goodbye. He thinks for a second and then walks to the jukebox and decides on the Verve's bittersweet symphony. Under his breath he says, I can change. 
He walks up to the bar to order another drink, whereupon the woman says to him, I love this song. They start talking to each other. He's mindful of what's happened over billions of years to make this conversation possible. At that moment, just for a second, he sees God winking at him in the mirror. Now you need to watch these were the most important events in the history of Earth. Or have a look at scientists submit actual proof aliens are watching you right now.